I joined this debate at a very critical juncture, having just listened to the Minister of Education, whose responsibility it was today to account for being a ministry and being a sector that has consistently featured at the highest level of our fiscal appropriations. They have been consistently receiving the biggest piece of the pie. And this year in particular, the education and training aspect received the biggest piece of the pie. And as I listened, I'm grateful to hear that the Minister of Education listened closely to the leader of the opposition. And I know as you came to lament that the leader of the opposition spoke for five minutes on education. Please understand that she's dedicated 27 years to education. So don't worry about that five minutes. You're looking at 27 years of service in educating the people of Trinidad and Tobago. And the Minister of Finance, in delivering his budget statement, spoke for hours, promised $6.8 billion to education and training, and mentioned education seven times, a total of seven times throughout that entire 164-page speech. And so I guess you listened to the leader of the opposition but didn't listen to the Minister of Finance, or else you'd have a lot more to lament here today. And, you know, I listened very intently to the Minister of Education, and I am convinced more than ever that the PNM's newest mantra must be that nobody lives here. Because from that statement, it, it must be clear that the minister believes nobody lives here and we do not experience a day-to-day -day reality in Trinidad and Tobago. Because to listen to a minister of education talk about all of the spaces where she remains a key stakeholder in the sector as an educator, as a parent, and, and, and being part of the system. And then to come to tell us that you have been consulting, you've been having these meetings, but you can't take into consideration and the fact that the people that you met with did not feel sufficiently satisfied. And that's not one group, two groups, it's all the groups. It is parents, it is teachers. You are talking about the main stakeholders in the education sector saying they are dissatisfied. But all we care about is if the Ministry of Education is satisfied. That could never be right, Madam Speaker. And I listened, and you know the key element, if you are going to talk about transitioning in a post-COVID world, a key element that you have to build as an administration in power would be trust. It would be trust and it would be to build trust with the people of this country because if they can't trust you to do the right thing and if they can't trust you to tell the truth, then they're not going to trust you with their transition. And I say that because I, the minister made a statement in trying to, to talk about the leader of the opposition's um, response to the budget. And the minister made a statement about the $50 million for laptops and that 40, 45 million was spent on laptops and the rest was spent on MiFi devices. And I just picked that up because I had my notes in front of me doing my preference budget debate. And in the budget document presented by the Minister of Finance, available to every member of parliament here, everybody, in those budget documents, Minister of Finance, in his report to the nation, said there was a procurement of 10,000 MiFi devices at a cost of $0.4 million. $0.4 million and $4 million is not the same thing. That's what the opposition leader meant when she tell, told you all the maths not matching, not making sense. Because how are you telling us the excess from the 50 million was spent on MiFi devices, but the Minister of Finance in the books written down is telling us that only $0.4 million was spent on, our, on procuring 10,000 MiFi devices. So either we cannot trust you, because you did not want to tell us the truth here today on term, in terms of how much was actually spent, or the math isn't just, isn't just simply not making sense. And <laughs> talking, we, 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 we embark on our budget debate and people are paying close attention. They want to hear 
what you've done. They want to hear what you intend to do. And they can only place faith and trust in terms of what you intend to do based on what you have accomplished. And the minister came out here today and read out statistics from a 10-year period to tell us that more needed to be done and that we can, we can do better in this sector because our children are not performing as they should and therefore we ought not to look to blame anybody. And coincidentally, Ms. O went on further in her speech to blame people for things. But I want to point out something very important. Because what we do here, and I've said that time and time again, what we do here is very serious business, it's very important business. And when you are talking as a policymaker, understand that decisions you make on a day-to-day -day basis directly affects the lives of the people of Trinidad and Tobago. And so in that period, 2010 to 2015, under a Kamala Passard Bissessa administration, there were deliberate inputs into the education sector. And there was, a, there was a system where we held to account whether or not we were meeting the objectives of the policy decisions made in the education sector. And in a report produced by the People's Partnership Administration in 2014, looking specifically at education, and I'm putting this on the record to just show as the minister read out statistics, when you have the correct policies in place, when you have targeted spending, and, and, and to suggest that the ministry is doing the best it could, it, it could do with its limited resources, $6.8 billion is not limited resources. It's more money than Dr. Tim Gopising got to run the Ministry of Education in those days. But the pass rate for math and language between 2010, what it was met, it was met at 39%. You had over 57% of students passing math. You had over 55% of students passing language arts. You had a 94% pass rate in CAPE for units one and two. You had one out of every nine students receiving scholarships. You had the best academic achievement in the history of the education sector in 2014. Two out of every three students received over 60% in SE. Three out of four obtained over 50%, and we had less than 14% receiving below 30% in the marks. And we have seen now a reversal of those numbers. And you have to ask yourself why? Because it's not a question of money. It is a question of value for money. This, the Ministry of Education now has continued on policies that were put in place in 2015. All of the policies which were by and large regressive and we are seeing the results of the regressive policy making right now, today as we speak. And so to come here and say, the problem isn't COVID, but simultaneously say the problem is COVID, it leaves the nation in a sense of confusion. Because if you had not systematically, systematically dismantled policies that you met in the education sector, which were working, and they were working based on the data that you have available to you, you would not be facing these problems today. Problems like the delivery of devices. I know, I know, it is a point that you all do not enjoy hearing. But had the laptop program continued, had it been optimized and improved upon, had you just admitted you found a good thing and kept it, we would not be in this position today. And that is a fact, it is a simple fact. But here we are scrambling, deciding one day whether it is 65,000 students needing devices, deciding whether it is 47,000 students needing devices, and listening to the Minister of Education tell us that the devices, they began handing out the devices in September of 2020, and the students were able to, be, they were able to go online. And then looking at a joint select committee report, a joint select committee of this parliament, a report produced in this year telling us that approximately 74, 
sorry, approximately 47,000 students never logged on to online learning since January 2021. That, 70, that these students have never logged on to online learning since January 2021. So then the question becomes, well, who did you give the devices to? And what are the direct inputs you are putting into place to ensure that students are logging on to their classes? Because, you know, we, we sit here and the minister came today and outlined the meetings that the ministry had as a direct response to the question as to whether or not you consulted with stakeholders. Having a meeting is not good faith consultation. You have to listen and then lead. That is the mantra of our political leader. That is what we follow. And if you, if you adopted that leadership approach, you would be doing much better right now. But had you participated in good faith consultations, you would be very well aware at this time that despite big PR machines to hand out devices, our students are still not able to get online. And why is that, Madam Speaker? Because I listened, you know, the political leader of the United National Congress came here today and responding to the budget, I am sure it's the first time members opposite realized that the Ministry of Digital Transformation had no website. And I, I know that when we are here discussing digital transformation, we are the, the government that is telling us that they will transform our digital infrastructure has been the government that has failed to maintain our physical infrastructure. They are still opening standpipes and then want to tell us we will get broadband and ICT before the end of the year. Amazing, Madam Speaker. But when we listened to the Minister, when we listened to the Minister of Finance and, and he spoke about the need for robust, high quality, affordable internet access, and that we were moving connectivity spots. I think you're going from six to 50 and they called out spaces. And then I realized that Minister of Education didn't come here to tell us any more details, but by and large, rural communities are still left out of these programs. So you are putting hotspots, you are putting spaces for persons who are already connected to the internet. And that is why you find yourself spending a lot of money and making absolutely no progress. Because you are not utilizing the data, you are not utilizing the information to make progress for Trinidad and Tobago. Can you imagine, can you imagine that you are coming here today to tell us that you are able, you are going to be able to connect students. You are going to be able to get students online. But in the past 19 months, you still cannot figure out how many students don't have access to devices and who are not connected to the internet. And you cannot figure out how to get the majority of this 47,000 students back online and in class. So, Madam Speaker, we are in a very scary space. We are in a very scary space because at the end of the day, if, you, if the policy makers are not interested in finding out, what the, the finding, getting the data to make reasonable, sensible inputs into the system, we will end up going nowhere very quickly. I listened to the Minister of Education talk about the reopening of schools and very triumphantly announced that more students would be allowed to go back out to school once they are vaccinated. But the minister failed to mention how many students from that form, four, five, and six cohorts of students, how many of them went back out to physical school since, um, since this physical school was reopened. You see, because that thing, if you are a logical, linear thinker, you would work out how many persons are accessing physical school and then based on that determine whether or not what you are doing is working. If it isn't working, 
then I would suggest you go back to the drawing board because the reports that we are seeing in the news, they said that 3,000 students access physical school. The information I'm getting from my constituency is that some schools are telling the students, look, only two people are going to come here. So we are not going to have physical school for two students or three students. So are we mama guying an entire nation? An entire nation? So you come here and triumphantly say more people can go back to physical school. But how many are going right now? I mean, re and this is the thing is, uh, the, to, to try to make that about politics or anything it would be ridiculous it's just a fact you have to ask yourself if what you are trying to do is working and if it isn't be able be big enough to be honest with yourself since you are telling the, the the stakeholders that you are in charge you are the final arbiter you would make all the decisions you are in charge here then be big enough to say listen what i did was not working maybe back to the drawing board and so I want to urge those in charge that when you are talking about vaccinated and non-vaccinated students, you get into a space of empathetic leadership. Think about what you are, you are talking to people about their children. Empathetic leadership should never go out of style. You need to acknowledge that you are asking persons who may be hesitant and you are trying to urge them to trust you and trust your spaces and do and, and get vaccinated to get back into the school system. And bullying will not work here. You need to approach this with empathy. You need to listen. I have had several constituents, several constituents come to me talking about their legitimate fears because they, they are not sure what information ought to be believed. And I myself am vaccinated and I try to have, I try to listen and give as much information as I can. But you cannot shame people, shame people into doing something when they are talking about their health and safety. So I'm urging empathetic leadership as you talk about the reopening of schools. You know, <laughs> the government really genuinely genuinely lives in an absolutely different reality from the rest of us in trinidad and tobago the leader of the opposition must be congratulated for putting on the public record here today all of the information about the current state of our economy but the fact of the matter is uh, madam speaker as we talk about blended learning systems and the digital divide the fact of the matter is that the, the Minister of Education, in giving us the pass, the pass marks for the most recent years, did not mention what happened with their package deal, with the, the, the delivery of school packages in, in, um, in school packages in the school system. Can you imagine talking about a blended system when the fact is the responsibility of the curriculum improvement lies squarely under the Ministry of Education. And that has not been optimized since 2020. So we're going through this entire COVID-19 pandemic. We're talking about blended systems. We're talking about online learning. And the Ministry has not sought to, in, to involve curriculum development in, in the way forward. In 2020, $187,000 was spent on curriculum development. $187,000. But now we are being told the plans are in the works. The plans are in the works. So what were you doing for the last five to six years? Because even if you want to dismiss the impact of COVID-19, the fact is you have been in charge of the sector for the past six years. And therefore, you ought to have more to report than failing grades. But you know, the leader of the opposition mentioned it. But ICT, broadband, Wi-Fi has been part of this government's mantra since 2015, 2016, 2017. Just promising increased infrastructure, better devices. Earlier, the Minister of Finance was very excited about the Wi-Fi devices last year. I don't know who received a Wi-Fi device yet. Can't name a person, didn't see one distribution ceremony. 
they're telling us that they procured 10 10,000 one person is giving us one figure another person is giving us another figure but at the end of the day at the end of the day pardon you do you the minister of national security would you pardon Director contribution. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I assume the Minister of National Security had a message for Mali's family so that he wanted a chance to give away. But when you speak, you could apologize to people for the dog. Okay? When you speak. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I don't understand why the Minister is so hot under the collar. He will have an opportunity to speak and account for what little work he does. So, Madam Speaker, I continue. The ICT access centers, no one, they cannot mention where these 50 ICT access centers would be housed and they're talking about value added services and increased training. We're also looking at an increased spending in digital skills training and you know, and technical skills training. So the Ministry of Finance in conjunction with not one but two ministries, Ministry of Digital Transformation and the Ministry of Education is now trying to get to teach people how to use a computer. And they have decided that... Th Please continue. Thank you, Madam Speaker. And you, you know, you look at the Minister of National Security and you understand why people don't want to take them very seriously. Just a lot of noise and very little substance, Madam Speaker. Very little substance. You could spell symbol? Thank you. Let's get on with it, please. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Thank you, Madam Speaker. So as I continue... I, the cross talk from Minister of National Security is not appropriate for this chamber. He's calling somebody. Hmm. Ah, member for point up here, I will already said, let's get on with it. Let's get on with it, please. <laughs> Madam Speaker, I want to turn to the matter of the EFCL workers. The Minister of Finance started to speak about wage negotiations in his contribution. The Minister of Education spoke for 45 minutes and not at, a, at any one point in time did she mention the plight of the EFCL workers. Can you imagine going to work, doing your work and then not being paid? I'm told that they've been told now they have to wait until December to receive their salaries. December. The Minister of Education opened her statement talking about her gratitude for the social programs, hampers and whatnot, and that she has seen for herself the plight of the people of Trinidad and Tobago, but has she seen the plight of the EFCL workers? Because they are directly under her remit, and therefore, therefore, she should want to advocate for them as well because you cannot have people working in this country and not being paid. You know, when we talk about the social contract that the government has with the people of Trinidad and Tobago, the fact is that you elect an executive and they have a responsibility to deliver on certain goods and services to people of Trinidad and Tobago. This is not people begging for a handout. They are not asking for anything that they did not work for. They are advocating for themselves for long overdue payments. And I bring up the social contract because I am getting into some matters now that directly face my constituency, the constituency of Tabakit. They We've all been looking on very closely, very closely at the, and listening to the government talk about the implementation of the property tax. More taxes, no problem, right? But what about more services? The Minister of Finance came here today, well, came here on Monday, sorry, to tell us that big trucks mashing up the roads. 
big trucks are the problem, they mashing up the roads. It is not that the Ministry of Works and Infrastructure has not embarked on our road repair program or any road maintenance. It is the big trucks that is the problem. And they are telling us that the government has no money. So you pay more into your taxes and then what? Do we still drive on these roads? Because I, on Wednesday, had to visit a condemned bridge in my constituency in 2021, a condemned wooden bridge, one of three bridges, main access roads that have that fell down in my constituency. But I also have to face persons coming to ask me about property tax forms. Fill this out what to do about this because they are trying to understand how they can be, uh, be they are being asked for more do more provide more the government needs more but you are receiving less when the political leader of the united national congress and the leader of the opposition <laughs> talked about pothole national movement we may talk glibly about it but if you drive through the areas that we represent and almost every part of Trinidad and Tobago, the state of infrastructural decay is at its very worst, Madam Speaker. The state of the, of the road infrastructure, the number of communities without pipe-borne water, and the fact that I have to visit not one, not two, but over 12 dangerous landslips. Dangerous landslips threatening persons' homes. The Minister of Works and Transport said, admitted here in this house that over 10% of the landslips identified for repair are in the Tabakit constituency. And we will come here and will have to admit to having rep um, repaired absolutely none. So when you account for the money and you tell us where the money is being spent, we live here. We can see that our roadways are not repaired, that we are still driving on wooden bridges, that we are mashing up our vehicles, trying to get to and from. And so you are talking about digital infrastructure on one end. You are talking about moving Trinidad and Tobago on the other end. And we cannot move from Gasparillo to, to, to San Fernando without mashing up your car. Can you imagine that, Madam Speaker? The Minister of Finance, again, happily announced an access road repair program to commence in 2022 with over 80 kilometers to provide relief for over 400 farmers at the cost of $75 million. And then he named the areas. Matlot, Toko, Manzanola, Sangre Grande, Talparo, Wallafield, Maraca, St. Joseph, Tuna, Puna, Orange Grove, Brasso Seco, Paria, and Blanchichez, Lopino, and Paramin and plummeter. Now, oh, Madam Speaker, I represent a large contingent of farmers in my constituency. A significant, a significant amount of produce, produce comes from the Tabakit constituency. You are looking at the farmers in Tabak, in Tabakit, the farmers in Lightbourne, the farmers in Grand Coover, you are looking at the farmers in Brothers Road, major, major farming communities left out of this access road program. Left out, and not for, not because we have not applied. I have written many, many letters imploring that our access roads be part of the priority program. Because if you are talking about feeding the nation, if you are serious about your investment in agriculture, you would be very serious about an investment in the Tabakit constituency. Because we are producing you have farmers that are able to produce, that are doing the work, that are adding value to society, that are assisting with our food supply, and yet still left out of your $75 million program. And then you wonder why people are unable to trust you. Because if you are using linear thinking, if you are taking a real data to make your decision making and not out and just just pulling it out of a hat you would understand that how you allocate the 75 million dollars should be spread around in major farming com com communities and Tabakit would be one of those you know the minister of finance talked about the road network and how it reflected 
key features in, the, in a developed country that the quality of infrastructure and transportation services is a key feature of our, of our developed society. And that we recognize that high quality infrastructure will unlock economic potential and will ensure the growth and opportunities are distributed throughout the country, the country and create employment opportunities in a business cycle with investment attraction. I became member of parliament for Tabakit in August of 2020. Early on in the term, I wrote to the Ministry of Tourism because we have a number of significant tourist attractions in the constituency. Outside of Nully's Tunnel, we also have, um, we have Flanagan Town, we have, they, there's a Christmas display. We have a number of tourist attractions and important spaces within the constituency. And if the minister was very serious about unlocking economic potential and unlocking the potential for ecotourism, then you would be looking to instruct the Minister of Works to fix our roads in Tabakit so people could get to these attractions. Because the problem right now, the problem right now is that you cannot access these spaces. And so <laughs> there is a rural development community, I'm um, sorry, company. There is a rural development component to the Ministry of Local Development, of local government, sorry. And that, and they, their entire mandate, their entire mandate was to ensure and accelerate the physical development of the country and to have a specific focus on rural areas. The Ministry of Local Government and Rural Development continues to receive a small share of the pie. But if you were serious about ensuring that there is resilience in Trinidad and Tobago in a post-COVID world. You have to unlock the potential of communities that are not within your sight right now. You cannot be doing the same things over and over and expecting different results. If you look at the potential in rural communities, if you look at the spaces for entrepreneurship, for, for the development of the agriculture sector, for the development of the tourism sector, if you look at these spaces as the hidden gems that they are in this country, we would be talking about a diversification program that is so wide that it would, in, it would engender hope that when you come here and you speak, people feel as if we are going somewhere. You know, you listened to the Minister of Finance talk about the resilience of the people, that our people who've been through so much, we are coming out okay. And then I also listened as he accounted, well, he gave us the number of persons accessing government help, hampers, food support, etc. And my colleague for social development will talk about the true state the true state of our economy and our people. But the idea that you can celebrate, that you can celebrate giving out grants and food support without acknowledging what that means for our economy and our society, it means our people are in trouble. It means that our people are unable to be aspirational unable to think about entrepreneurship, unable to think about what the next step is because they are thinking about food. How to access food. That is where we are as a nation in 2021. And you could say COVID exacerbated this situation because a, no a number of persons are now unemployed that were not previously unemployed. But before that, before that, anybody in public life can tell you that what we were looking at are a number of persons who were just focused on survival. Just trying to figure out how to survive in Trinidad and Tobago. And therefore, how can they take advantage of your research and development grant if you are thinking about food and your roads and whether or not you will have a water supply today or tomorrow? How can you take advantage of your entrepreneurial grants if you are worried about putting a roof over, the, over your family's head? 
How can you think about moving forward when you don't know how you are going to make it through today? And so, Madam Speaker, if you are serious, if anyone across there is serious about building an aspirational society, you have to start by providing the basics to the people of Trinidad and Tobago. Do your job. The Minister of Education said that their mantra is work, work, work. So how come we are not seeing it? Where is work going? What work are you doing? Because then if you were working, why are things so bad? Why are things so bad? As I come to my conclusion, Madam Speaker, I want to again congratulate the Leader of the Opposition for her contribution today. Because in all of the melee, the leader of the opposition was still able to stand here and deliver a plan for the development of Trinidad and Tobago. And she did so in a way to ensure that while our society is literally fighting for its life, that you can understand that there are policymakers in this country still thinking about what we can do not just to kickstart the economy, not just to survive, but to thrive as a nation. And I long for the day that I can have policy discussions without it being in the back of my mind that my constituents are looking on and worried about their roads, box trains and whatnot. I remember hearing laughter about box trains and I can tell you when I see constituents, half the time the request is for a box train. And so therefore, if as a government, you can provide, if you can just do your job, we would have an easier time as a society. We're not asking you for magic, you know. We're asking you to do your job, your literal job. And then we would be better off. But you don't want to do that. And so, Madam Speaker, as I conclude, I want to assure the people of Trinidad and Tobago that we will continue to hold the government to account we will continue to provide alternative policies. We will continue to advocate on your behalf because there's one group of people who would continue to listen to people of Trinidad and Tobago, and that is the United National Congress. And I thank you, Madam Speaker.